Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Do you train hard with wearable tech like an Apple Watch, a Garmin, and an Oura Ring, hoping that it will improve your performance, but get frustrated when the data doesn't seem to match how you feel. You know what I'm talking about. Like when you have that readiness score that says you're a 90 today, you really feel like garbage. Well, our guest today is Peter Tierney, a health and performance coach who has worked with elite rugby and soccer teams and currently works as a senior research scientist at Lululemon. And we're gonna dig into this. He shares insider tips on key metrics you should be focusing on, using mismatches between feelings and data to assess illness risk, adjusting load based off of readiness scores and so much more. You know, Peter is somebody that I hold in high regard and I love his social media content. That's actually how I found him. He puts out practical tips on wearables, human performance. You should definitely check it out. So let's get right to it. Let's lean in and learn from the best. Peter, I love wearable tech. I obviously have a company around this, but you have fantastic social media platform where you're you you know you're sharing education with folks and making things really simple. What I'd like to start with today is how do we get the most out of our wearable technology? What metrics matter most? Which ones can we just kind of ignore? Yeah, I get this question from a lot of people all the time. And I always try to avoid use the words, it depends, but the metrics to focus on often are related to your goals. So if you are an elite professional marathon runner, the metrics that you focus on might be slightly different to a general population like myself, like a someone who's active or someone who's focusing very much on addressing health issues also might be very different. Now, having said that, I also do think there are commonalities because I always talk about you can't have performance without health, in my opinion. So mm. even those elite, the elites of the elites and the top, top 1% of people at that level still have to be healthy or still should be trying to be healthy and considering their long-term health as well. So some of those metrics, like for example, like a resting heart rate value to me is as valuable or as important for an everyday person and an elite professional athlete as well. Okay. So let's focus on the recreational athlete, somebody that's lifting weights, going to the gym, cares about their cardiovascular fitness, wants to live a longer life. Maybe they're in their 30s or 40s and they want to make sure that they're maintaining muscle or actually maybe putting a little bit on. What are the metrics that you would say would be important for them to track from their wearable? And which ones are you like, ah, you can forget about that. (laughs) So in that situation, I think it also comes down to what is actually accurate or what those Mm. wearables or what the technologies can actually measure correctly. Because, you know, there might be things that are very useful, but potentially at the moment aren't, you know, fully accurate or aren't as accurate enough to make action from. Now, do I think we'll get to that place with a lot of a lot more metrics? I think so, just based on how quickly the data has evolved and the technology has evolved over the last 10 years and how accurate it's gotten as well. So that's probably one caveat. But the couple that I always sort of resort to or lean to, I guess they're around overnight or resting and also during activity. They're the sort of two avenues that I think of them in. So if we focus firstly on overnight or variables at rest, I would predominantly look at total sleep time, so that's an hours or minutes. I would think about resting heart rate, heart rate variability, and then some devices can offer a reading of like a temperature deviation or a breathing rate or a respiratory mm. rate. And they're sort of the true, I guess, raw physiological values that are measured from the devices. Of course, they have some processing, but they're the ones to me that have a level of accuracy, validation, for the actual numbers, but also in terms of how you can interpret them. And that's probably the second point is it's not necessarily just about collecting these things. It's it's actually the nuance and and the interpretation of the data and trying to identify trends. If this is a positive or a negative, is it something I need to address? Is it just a blip? So some of those factors. And then if I jump to during exercise, I think that's slightly different. For me, this is dependent on the type of activity. So I guess I'll spit them, like you said, into maybe like cardio respiratory fitness and maybe some like resistance training. For resistance training, for me personally, I don't see huge value in some of the metrics and wearables at the moment. That's not to say that they won't get to that point for this person. So this sort of general population person. So for the, I guess, cardiovascular, respiratory fitness type work, heart rate, 
would be a predominant one. And then if you're into sort of running or cycling, there's some pace and distance variables as well. But that's my long winded answer to try to get to your question. No, I think it's great. You have a really cool chart on your social media where you kind of have this intersecting lines of important and useful is on the X axis. And you look at this Y axis of ability to measure and the area that would be very helpful, but isn't being measured by the wearable is the context, your mood, your energy, your sleep, your stress, your soreness. I think motivation is very important to assess. And as a sports scientist working with athletes for a number of years, I about 16 years of doing that. If you don't have context for these things, also, you can get in trouble with using these data's when, data points when you're trying to manipulate training. The other thing that I found was a problem is a lot of times those are lagging indicators where how you feel in the moment is a leading indicator. It's actually more sensitive than actually some of these training load metrics. And so do you assess this yourself? Do you have a reporting mechanism? Do you use like a, a wellness questionnaire for yourself or with athletes you used to work with? Yeah. And the one point I'll add to this, and I think I'll answer maybe indirectly, when you you mentioned this sort of like perception versus the sort of objective that, and to me, often people expect the variables or the metrics to match perfectly with how I feel or how someone feels. And to me, that's not necessarily always true or shouldn't always be true. And the true value to me for some of these wearable devices are actually when those things don't match or they mismatch. So for example, If I wake up tomorrow morning and I wake up and I feel normal, I feel as alert as I normally am. I, you know, I wake up, do my everything else. I check my phone and my wearable device shows I have a resting heart rate that is a standard deviation or 10 beats per minute outside of my normal range. Then I look at my temperature reading and overnight it's been, you know, a massive variance in that as well. To me, that is cause for me to not necessarily panic and throw all my day out the window, but for me to go, okay, Why is my data showing one thing and I feel this way? Is it something that I need to action right now? Then I start to ask myself some of those questions to get back to your question. Okay, like, did I do anything yesterday that would have prompted a a negative response in physiology? Did I drink alcohol? Okay, well, if I did, then that's probably why. I have a change in variables, but if I didn't, if I wasn't more stressed, if I don't remember anything, maybe that is an illness that is sort of preemptively highlighted or, or sort of brought to my attention from a wearable device. So that's just like one example of like the situation where I think the mismatch is actually the value as opposed to the mirroring. And then just to your point around how I would assess that for me personally, I don't like I sometimes do from time to time from measuring some stuff, actually record like a questionnaire. But often with athletes, it is uh, questionnaire based, but that's layered with some objective data. So that might be with in an athlete setting, that might be the previous day or previous three days of external load. So distance covered, power output, gym tonnage, plus this morning's uh, soreness, moods, energy, motivation to train, plus some sleep data, potentially some wearable data now. And that sort of, to me, is trying to paint the full picture of, okay, I've got all these like contextual variables that I can sort of paint, like sort of make a decision for this athlete on that day. Yeah, that's what we do at AIM7. My company is we blend all this together. And what I found very interesting is in the athlete population, when you would give these athletes these questionnaires, a lot of time they get annoyed. And it was like five, 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 five out. But every once in a while, they would be like five, 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 six, five out. And you're like, oh, okay. That's something. In the general population, I found that people appreciate it. They actually value the fact that they get a moment to take stock of how they feel and what's going on. And they start developing this interoception. And so for us, we found it to be incredibly valuable. One of the messages that we've had to work really hard on is helping people understand like, well, why am I filling this out? Like, you're basically making decisions on my training based off of how I feel. I'm like, well, it's part of the equation. If you tell me you're really motivated, but your biometrics are a little bit off, And then I tell you, you can't work out. Do you think you're going to ever use this app again? (laughs) No. The comparison is a great one. I have the exact same experience where sometimes athletes I have worked with do that repetitive. They know exactly, you know, just the same question, same order. And in some environments, you know, we have called that out. And we said, look, at the end of the day, this information is not for us. It's for you. (laughs) So your input is what is going to help us make the best decisions for you. 
But the other thing which I think people maybe forget about sometimes is depending on the phase of training that you're in. So whether if you're in a, an intense training phase, if you have a marathon or a, or a competition or whatever the event or a sport you do, there are going to be times where you should be sore. Mm-hmm. There are going to be times when you should be fatigued and you should be stressed. Now, not, not to say that should be every day consecutively, because that's probably a recovery question after that. But right. there are times when you might have to train when your HRV, your heart rate variability is a little bit decreased. And that's okay to do that. Now, is it okay to do that all the time? That's a separate question. But sometimes I think people can get a little bit frightened. They see a slightly reduced physiological metric and they think, oh, I can't run today. I can't do anything. I, I'm going to call in sick. I got to do all. And it's like, no, 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 you can still do all these things. Maybe if your soreness and mood and energy is low as well, maybe we reduce the intensity a little bit or we make small tweaks. Or the volume. That sweet, or the volume. You get back into that sweet spot of, of all your variables and perceptions sort of sitting in one happy place. Yeah, I think that, you know, especially for power speed athletes, volume is the killer. And there's, a, I guess, a, a motto we lived by, which was stimulate, don't annihilate. And so even with the members of AIM-7, it's like, you know, that I work with, it's like, you can still stimulate, you can actually stimulate recovery by going and doing something. Just don't annihilate yourself. If everything is red, your mood, everything. And this is my one issue with these boutique fitness studios. I think it's great for people to have a community go to exercise with. I think it's great that social connectedness is really important for physical and mental health but they're over indexing on crushing yourself and you know, which ones I'm talking about. And so the days where they're just worn down and then they go in and winning is crushing yourself. They just keep building a deeper, well, maybe they should just go and keep their heart rate at a lower rate and just go through, enjoy their uh, their friends and just take it down a notch. And that's winning. I think that's where these boutique fitness studios lose out is that people just get burnt out. It's always to the tent, you know, as hard as you can go. And that's not realistic. Yeah, 100%. And to be fair, I've had some experiences in different classes. Like I've tried, I try go to different classes. I try to do different activities. That's partly just what I enjoy doing, but also just to experience different environments. And I have been to some of those places where actually the coaches have said, if you have a, a niggle or an injury or sore here, like, tell me, I'll adjust it. Like, obviously right. it's, it is difficult in some of those settings because the purpose is those like high intensity, like push, push, push. But I actually have had some positive experience with a coach saying, look, if you're not feeling it today, I'm going to say as a recommendation, it's a six out of 10 for the class. But if you need to, you go to a four out of 10. And so that's probably the, I think that's the ideal state. That's not to say that every single environment has that, but I think that is the sort of future, hopefully the current status of training. Like you said, there's so many benefits to training in groups and with people, but as long as it isn't digging a hole deeper for you or the individual. Did you know that pretty much everything we talked about today is wrapped up into AIM-7? We have a daily calibration that assesses how you feel in the areas of your mood, your energy, your sleep, your stress, soreness, motivation. And then we combine that with your objective wearable data to deliver daily personalized recommendations for your mind, body, and recovery so you can look, feel, and perform your best. If you haven't tried AIM-7 yet, try it now. You can start free for seven days. The link is in the show notes. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you on the next episode.